On Geek Therapy Radio this week, it's Cars, Cars, Cars. The gorgeous $19 million Bugatti La Voitre Noire is as beautiful as it is expensive. And more tasty details on the soon-to-be-unveiled Tesla Model Y. And I'm spazzing out over the new DeLorean biopic starring Alec Baldwin titled Framing John DeLorean. So start your engines. This week's show is Pedal to the Metal. Yeah. This is Geek Therapy. And now, your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. There's way too much to get to in the show today, so here's the introduction. GeektherapyRadio.com. That's your jumping off point for all the podcasts, and that gets you to the YouTube channel as well, Geek Therapy Radio on YouTube. Like, follow, subscribe, all the social media and YouTube, and this and that's about Geek Therapy Radio. I'd love to have you. Don't be a stranger. Packed show, packed car show today. So let's start with the most expensive new car of all time. The $12 million Bugatti La Voiture Noire. Did I pronounce that right? La Voiture Noire. It just means the black car. Anyways, I butchered that. $12 million, that's before tax. After taxes, this car cost almost $19 million, making it, like I said, the most expensive new car in the world of all time. However, this car was built by Bugatti for just one person. One owner told Bugatti what they wanted, and Bugatti built it for him. It's a one-off. So it's really strange to think that the Chiron and the Veyron are basically bulk vehicles built on ma- in mass compared to uh, the La Noire. That's what I'm going to call it from here on out, the La Noire. So $19 million. It's funny to me as I'm doing my research with all this that some publications... Uh, they attempt to justify the price. They say, wait for, you know, just keep on reading. We'll justify why this costs $19 million. That's so funny to me. You don't need to justify a $19 million car. This isn't a $40,000 Camaro you're begging your wife to let you buy. There's no justification needed. The person who bought this car wrote a blank check to Bugatti and just said, make me the best car in the world that you have ever made, and I will pay any price. So the person who's paying $19 million for this can probably afford $19 million, probably doesn't have to beg his spouse to buy it. He's just buying it, he or she. Let's not speculate, but it's probably he. Come on, let's just be honest. Ladies, chime in here. Would you buy a $19 million car? Even if it was the the coolest car in the world, would you buy it? I suspect that there'd be more men who would make such a stupid purchase decision than a lady. But you absolutely can. There's nothing stopping you from buying a $19 million car. Anyways, moving on. Let's talk about a little bit of the history here, because I think it really makes the car just that much cooler when you kind of understand where it came from. The La Noire was inspired by Jean Bugatti's lost but iconic 57 SC Atlantic. Uh, the La Noire is based on the Devo, and the Devo itself is basically just a track-focused Chiron. It's a, it's a Bugatti Chiron that's just set up for racing on the track exclusively with aerodynamics um, and various other bits, weight reduction, everything like that. So to fully appreciate the La Voiture Noire, In the 30s, Bugatti developed the Type 57 platform, kind of like the MQB platform uh, Volkswagen. They build Golfs and Jettas on and various other things. Other manufacturers, we still we still adopt the same production techniques now. So anyways, the Type 57 platform, some were sedans, some were coupes, then others were convertibles and even race cars. Finally, there were just four models of the 57 SC called the Atlantic, and each model was a little different, or very different, but the most famous was number two. This was Jean Bugatti's, J-E-A-N, Jean Bugatti's personal car called La Voiture Noire, which literally means, if you haven't can tell already, the black car. This was driven exclusively by Jean Bugatti himself, and he only allowed a select few of his racing friends to drive it. So people he trusted himself and people he trusted inherently with the car. Uh, the La Noir was used as a promotional vehicles, as a, pr- a promotional vehicle, so for like productions and taking pictures of it and all that stuff, it was just advertising for Bugatti. As the story goes, it disappeared in 1938. And though this is surrounded by speculation, Jean Bugatti himself said that it was moved to a safer part of France after the Nazis invaded Alsace. 
others say was given to one of his racing friends in 1939 and wound up in Bordeaux in 1941 with a different chassis number glued to the frame. So, no matter its actual whereabouts, it hasn't been seen since, at best, the early 1940s. So, if it were found in a barn somewhere, if you're a, a treasure hunter, it would be worth over $120 million today. So, happy hunting to you. So, we don't know much about the owner this car was built for, the 2019 La Noir, but we do uh, know that he would like to remain private. He or she would like to remain private uh, and that's fine with me because privacy is important. Even if you're rich, you should still have the right to privacy. Uh, all we know about this person is that they were very much fascinated by the original Bugatti Atlantic from the late 1930s. Uh, the 12 million dollar, or sorry, 19 million dollar La Noir. The design is breathtaking. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to show you pictures of it and all sorts of whatever, so you can see it on YouTube or anywhere. You don't have to be watching this YouTube video to see it. This is just a podcast. Uh, the design is breathtaking. Normally, I don't like, I don't like most of hyper exotics how they're designed. I think they're gaudy. I think they're ridiculous, and they're kind of, it, kind of, you know, it sounds weird, really weird to say this, but it'd be embarrassing, kind of, to be seen in. Uh, but the Bugatti La Noir is abs it's breathtaking. Let's talk some numbers here. And they're pretty fascinated, fascinating in their simplicity. The engine is the exact same from the Chiron and the Devo. It's a quad turbo, 8 liter, 16 cylinder engine producing 1,500 horsepower and 1,180 foot pounds of torque. So yeah, it's quick. It's pretty quick. Uh, since the La Noir has been designed to be an ultra comfortable long distance GT, road tripper no performance figures are officially given however we do know that the chiron will do 100 or sorry 100 100 that the chiron will do 261 miles per hour and the devo limited by grippy aerodynamics will do a comparatively plebeian 236 miles an hour so the la noir should do somewhere in between 236 and 261 miles per hour while 60 miles per hour should be dispatched in a similar two and a half seconds and with that i need a cold shower a 19 million dollar car and what's so cool you know also honestly is that he said Whoever bought this, I'm just assuming it's a he, whatever that says about me, I'm sorry. But he said that he wanted it to be comfortable to drive long distances. He didn't want it to be the fastest car in the world for $19 million. He wanted it to be comfortable and beautiful. At doing about 250 miles an hour, I don't think he's going to be suffering in the speed of anyways. More Geek Therapy Radio coming up. Don't go anywhere. Let's talk about other car stuff. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. I am your mental curator, as always, Johnny Hamburger. If you're listening to the podcast, thank you. Please subscribe to it in whatever player you are using. Hit that plus sign or the check sign or the subscribe button. I don't know what it looks like on your particular player. Uh, we here at iHeartRadio, of course, prefer the iHeartRadio app. It is actually a good uh, podcasting app and, and live streaming radio app, of course. Uh, if you can't catch Geek Therapy Radio at 10 p.m. Central Time here in Houston, Texas, as it broadcasts on KPRC 950 AM, you use the iHeartRadio app to listen to it wherever you are in your part of the world adjusting for time. You can just ask your Alexa or your Google, just say, hey, Alexa, play a KPRC 950 on the iHeartRadio app. And at 10 p.m. Central Time, you'll hear it out of your speakers and beautiful digital clarity. And I take a lot of pride in the audio quality of my uh, of my radio show and podcast. So I don't know, however it's streamed, however it's compressed and streamed on your end, just be assured that when I upload it, when I put the show onto the air, that I am providing the most pristine audio possible when i upload the podcast i'm uploading at 320 kilobits per second mp3s it's the highest quality mp3 stereo that you can possibly do and this is geeking out a little bit for kind of audio geeks and audio files it's hard to test you know say if a 320 bit kilobits per second mp3 is considered audio file grade but it's the best i can upload as a podcast when i put the shows into the radio station here they're at 256 kilobits per second 
I can't speak for what other shows do. My background is in audio engineering, so I take a huge amount of pride in providing you with the best quality audio podcasts and broadcasts you can possibly listen to. Like I said, that's before whatever compression algorithm does whatever its thing to it. So like you're watching this on YouTube, it's not going to be the highest quality audio that I uploaded. YouTube is obviously going to compress it to some extent. And we all know how radio signals are compressed before they go in a different way. Audio compression out to the uh, antenna. The difference between digital and, and just physical audio compression is an entire another episode of Geek Therapy Radio. We can get into all that. Um, but I'm just letting you know, I take very much a lot of pride in the audio that I present to you. The content, eh. That's hit or miss. That's hit or miss, but that's just the nature of radio. Uh, but I do know my subscribers are going up on YouTube and every measure, measurable metric, you know, podcasts and thereabouts. It's hard to measure um, broadcasts like Nielsen. Not many people have Nielsen boxes. It's kind of it's harder to extrapolate through there. But with digital, with podcasts and with YouTube and that kind of thing, I can see exactly how many. I can't see who you are, obviously, but I can see just numbers representing how many people are streaming, downloading uh, obviously watching the videos on YouTube or subscribing to the channel. I can see kind of all that stuff. So I very much appreciate all of you. I'm a little less than three years into us into this. This is still just the beginning seeds of whatever geek therapy radio is growing into. So I really love you all for sticking around with me and, and seeing me grow. You know, some shows are probably better than others. I am proud of all of them. But thank you for being uh, with me from the beginning. That means a lot to me. And thank you also. We'll talk about Tesla in this segment, I promise, in the Model Y. But thank you also for not BSing me. Do you know what I'm saying here? You know, if the, if something is not up to snuff, and not just if you just disagree with something, that's different. And we're not talking about disagreeing on any topics or subject matter, but... If, if you say, oh, that last show was weak, it didn't grab me, it didn't catch me, you know, whatever, you, you don't like the way that uh, the, the format, however it's flowing, the cadence is weird, you know, some of that can be chalked up to just different feel each show, how I'm feeling, maybe if I'm sick, or maybe, you know, we just feel out of it. It's like a batter going over five one night. You just, you're just out of the zone. Maybe you go for 10 games without a hit. That's kind of the same way in radio. We're, I'm doing all this off the cuff, and either I'm firing all cylinders, all 16 Chiron cylinders, or the cadence is just just a little off. But thank you for those of you who constructively give uh, the criticism. A lot of people can't handle criticism, and it's, it's kind of a learned trait to learned ability to be able to hear criticism and very quickly put away the sting of it and just hear hear the meat of what they're saying hear the actual just be logical about it and also if you're a creator if you're a content creator if you're watching this on youtube or something listen to podcasts you make podcasts um you make videos on youtube here's a little bit of advice for content creators also if you're doing the best you can and you're having fun first and foremost you just have fun with it if you're doing the best that you can with what you have and your material is getting better and better it's all about progress it's not about numbers it's about progress if you're getting better and better and you let's say you get some dislikes on videos i get plenty of dislikes on my videos i have pl plenty of trolls in the in the comments sometimes but take stock of how many how many people are are giving you crap some just dis disregard the trolls um but learn from learn from those criticizing you and also take solace in the fact that it's not most people most people like what you're doing most people like what you are doing don't let the one person out of a hundred or out of a thousand or whatever it is that's bringing you down or being mean or being overly critical don't let that sway you from the path obviously 90 percent of what you're doing is correct so don't lose track based on the 10 percent but also don't be oblivious. If someone is, if you have a reoccurring criticism, address that. Obviously, if more than one person is addressing the same thing, don't be in denial about it. Just address it. And however you want to address it is up to you. Um, I haven't, 
if someone's going to critique, for instance, on YouTube, like any of in video editing or something like that, I'm not a video editor. I'm, I'm learning all that as I go. So I'm not going to take much personal insult from someone criticizing video editing techniques. Uh, and I guess we'll wait till Tesla for the next segment if I don't get into it in a minute here. Uh, so if someone's criticizing something that you're actively learning, like like video editing, take that for for what it is. All I'm basically getting at here is don't lose hope. If you're having fun with it, first and foremost, like I said at the beginning, if you are having fun with it, that's the most important thing about doing anything creative. Don't force yourself if you're not having fun with it. And I use that analogy to hear me out here, because that sounds weird to uh, say, because practice practices make perfect, practice makes better, and sometimes you don't want to practice. But when I'm uh, giving somebody some like basic guitar lessons or some tips for playing guitar. I've played guitar since, oh, God knows when, since I was 10 years old, 11 years old. I'm not a virtuoso by any stretch of the imagination, but I know enough to get other people started. You know, buy your first guitar and kind of get you started with the cage sequence, C A G E D chords, and kind of help you through that. Because when you pick up something new, for instance, like I'm saying, a uh, guitar and you're learning guitar, it's very fresh and you're all fired up about it. And it only makes things worse if you're a perfectionist, but you're all fired up about it initially. You're very excited to do it. But what you find out is you have we have all these, we glamorize it in our head. We, put, we see it through rose colored glasses. And then when we actually start to do it, we, f- we figure out, holy crap, my fingers hurt. How does anyone hold down a guitar neck in strings? This is absolutely killing my fingers. So you start to experience the pain that is associated with growth. And it kind of starts slowly seeping in and putting you off to it. Sooner, you know, sooner or later, that guitar that you were so excited for is in a closet somewhere collecting dust or whatever. So my advice has been, if you start getting overly dis... If you don't feel like practicing one day, if you really just hate the idea of practicing one day, you can skip a session, okay? It makes way more sense to come back at it when you're amped about it, when you're enthusiastic about it. You'll learn way more when you are excited to be doing it. So yes, there is some degree of forcing yourself to practice, but don't do something creative if it just, if it leaves a bad taste in your mouth if you just wind up hating it just don't do it if you hate it practice yes force through somewhat but if you really don't want to do it for a long period of time then maybe it wasn't for you so if you're a content creator just have fun with it first and foremost take the criticisms with a grain of salt but take them logically thinking about them logically and don't lose hope. We'll be right back with more Geek Day Pro Radio. Let, let's really talk about Tesla, I promise, right here, segment three. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hemberger. I produce this show. I edit this show. I do the show prep for the show. I edit the videos for YouTube. I schedule the guests. I meet with sponsors. One man show here. Eventually, if it grows big enough, I would like to hire on a producer and someone to help with some of the technical stuff. But right now, it's just me. So, and I love it. I mean, I love every aspect of it. I'm, I don't think that I'm too controlling or, or too anal about that. But it's just I'm having a lot of fun doing it all right now while I can do it all right now. Uh, anyways, we're going to talk about Tesla in this segment. Um,. But real quick, real real first, and I promise this is is quick. This is the longest segment, so give me some give me some space here to geek out about some car stuff. The Koenigsegg Jesco is going to be a combustion quote unquote mega car, and its aim is 300 miles per hour. It wants to be the first 300 mile per hour production vehicle of all time. It's a twin turbo V8, 1600 horsepower on E85, unleaded. That's crazy. 300 horsepower. Quick little physics, basic physics lessons, because I'm not a, a, a physicist or anything like that. Basically, the faster you go, the harder the atmosphere pushes against you not to go so fast. 
um, there's an there's a formula and it's exponential. It's kind of like as you approach the speed of light, you need exponentially more uh, energy to approach the speed of light. So you can get 99% of the speed of light, but that last 1% is just an unimaginable amount of, of energy, more than what it takes to go 99%. So kind of the same thing in cars. It comes down to aerodynamics and horsepower to push through the air and all sorts of things. So the Koenigsegg Jesko is 1,600 horsepower car that's targeting the magic number of 300 miles per hour. Other vehicles can go 300 miles per hour. Dragsters routinely do 300 miles per hour. But this is a, this is a car that you could go to the Koenigsegg showroom and buy. Probably for a lot of money, but it would get you 300 miles per hour. At least that's the hope. That's what Koenigsegg is pushing for. So this got me going down a little tangent. And this here, it relates to Tesla because it has to do with electric cars. Uh, the Rimac, R-I-M-A-C, um, is a, uh, don't quote me on this, but it's one of the fastest, elect at least one of the fastest electric cars in the entire world, if not the fastest. It's so weird to say, because even if right now, as I'm saying it, it the Rimac was the fastest uh, electric car in the world, tomorrow it couldn't be. An hour from now, it couldn't be. Someone else, the, things move, so forgive the pun, fast in the automotive world. That just saying something is the fastest today or the most expensive today in an hour, that won't be true anymore. There's something faster and better and more expensive that's always coming out. So the Remac is fully electric. And this Koenigsegg Jesko I'm talking about is, is a combustion engine, still relies on gasoline. So there's this, this conundrum, this technical... Um, hurdle that the that cars have to get over that combustion engine cars have to get over when they use turbos turbos it's la it lags if you have a turbo vehicle right now like you have a turbo volkswagen jetta right now you put your foot down on the gas and you, there's a little bit of there's a tiny bit even way less now than there were even 10 years ago it's a turbo lag you put the foot down and you wait a second and then you feel the shove in your butt that was a very horrible term to use, but you feel the kick in your pants of the car propelling forward as the turbo spool up from the exhaust and force more air into the engine and more oxygen to make more bang, basically. But that takes a little while. It's a little process. So the way that hybrid combustion engine vehicles get around this is they use the electric motors to use that, all that instant torque to make up for the turbo lag. And as the torque runs out, the turbos are kicked in and it gets over the turbo lag in that way. What the Jesco does is it has basically compressed air ready to go that spool up the turbos instantly before the exhaust starts putting out enough air to spool up a, tr a traditional turbo. It uses canisters of compressed air to spool up the turbos first so they're all ready to go no matter when you push your foot on the gas. And that got me thinking to this. Electric cars like Tesla Model S and, and the new Model Y we'll talk about here in a moment, they rely on electric motors, but it's a single, for the most part, it's a single drive electric motor. There's one gear. There's no manual transmissions, uh, so to speak in electric vehicles and i was thinking about that why is that why is it only one one forward gear basically one backwards gear uh to propel electric cars faster than they already go as we all know uh electric cars are are faster off the line zero to 60 than most combustion engine cars that's a product of the monstrous amount of torque that electric motors provide it's an instant torque anywhere you are whatever speed you're driving normal speed you're driving there's instant torque available that's an advantage of electric motors over traditional combustion engines so going back to why are there any manual transmissions in electric cars it goes to that torque there's not a there's really not many clutches that you can buy off the shelf that can handle the torque of electric motors because yeah if you're putting out that much horsepower and torque from an electric motor it seems why don't they just add more gear so you can shift into six gear a really long gear and then easily go 300 miles an hour quote unquote easily well the torque even just getting the clutch plate to match up like it in a tr traditional combustion engine there's so much force there to match the power to transfer to the wheels that it would just ex it would shatter a traditional manual transmission so that's why there's no manuals in uh, electric vehicles traditionally there may be some one or with one or two gears you know what i'm saying but traditionally okay this is an 11 minute segment we're at six and a half minutes in let's talk about tesla specifically the tesla model y
I talked on this week's Midweek Geek, which is why you should subscribe to the podcast, because Midweek Geek is not on the broadcast at all. It's a subscription. Uh, it's a it's a podcast only version of Geek Therapy Radio. It's an addition to Geek Therapy Radio. It's called Midweek Geek. And I was talking about how the Model 3, specifically the, the quote unquote newly announced $35,000 Model 3 is finally here. And of course, the phone rings. I guarantee you it's going to be a sales call. KTRH. And it was, and I'm leaving that edit in there. Uh, the $35,000 Model 3 is finally available and how that is going to be, to date, Tesla's most important vehicle, even more important than the Halo cars, because the $35,000 Model 3 puts a Tesla within range of the middle class. $37,000 is the national average for a new car, which sounds high to me, but that's apparently what the national average is for a new car. So $35,000 Tesla is two grand below the national average of a new car, and that puts it right in the range of of uh, the middle class. And this is what Tesla needs because Tesla needs to start selling cars to the middle class to start to even have, have a chance of competing with Volkswagen and Ford and Chevy when they start producing their electric vehicles in earnest. When the big major global auto auto manufacturers start making electric cars, Tesla needs to ramp up production now, needs to ramp up sales now if it has any uh, chance of holding that market segment. So, in one of their efforts to do this, uh, Elon Musk is going to announce and unveil, he says, the Model Y in uh, uh, March 14th, on March 14th. Um, basically, the Model Y is the... Cr- it's kind of a crossover between a sedan and an SUV. It's a crossover. Like there's so many crossovers available today. I think whatever. I I'll spare my opinions on crossovers. I have nothing morally against them. It's just I won't ever drive a crossover. I won't ever drive an SUV for that matter. If Daddy needs to carry things, Daddy's getting a station wagon, V8 twin turbo, Mercedes AMG, whatever. Maybe not even that. It could just be a Golf All Track or whatever. Just a. I would rather have a station wagon than an SUV or a minivan. But back on track here. So the Model Y is basically going to be a crossover mid-range SUV to add to Tesla's lineup, where uh, the Model X is basically built on the Model S sedan. Uh, They cost around $100,000. The Model X does, $80,000, $100,000, whatever it is. The Model Y is going to be built on the Model 3 platform, and that's going to hit that market segment. Uh, Elon Musk says it's going to be about 10% more expensive than the Model 3, but I can't imagine the crossover Model Y having um, just one electric motor. Uh, there's v- different variants of the Model 3 that it's going to be based on. The $35,000 version has one electric motor. Uh, the thirty, The $47,000 Model 3 has two electric motors. So I would imagine that the bigger car is going to have the two electric motors. And if it's based on the Model 3, then what Musk means is it's going to be 10% more expensive than the $47,000 Model 3. So what's 10%, what's 47,000 times 0. I $4,700 more? So around 50,000, but that's going to be too expensive. Maybe, maybe Musk actually does mean that it's going to be 10% more expensive than the $35,000 version, which would put it at about still below uh, $40,000. That would be way more likely here. Either either way, we're going to know way more about the Model Y here on March 14th. I keep wanting to say June, but it's March 14th. We'll know more about the Tesla Model Y. And, I, and now as I'm speaking, as I'm saying it, I do think it's going to be 10% more expensive than $35,000. Look for it under forty grand. That's my prediction. Uh, March 14th. Guess what? Two days after that, I'm married. I am off. I am not a bachelor anymore. I will be married. So when you hear this show on 16th, yes, I'll make a new show for the 16th. I'll be a married geek. More Geek Therapy Radio coming up. Let's talk about the new DeLorean movie. I am freaking out. Welcome back to... Yeah, welcome back to Mental Curator. I'm your host, Geek Therapy Radio. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. I am your Mental Curator, Johnny Hamburger. Real quick, I always, I feel like I always say that real quick, and then I go off into a four-minute thing. This is not going to be a four-minute thing, but real quick. If you haven't noticed already, here are the current models 
other than the Roadster or Roadsters. Here's the current models of Tesla. The Model S, the Model 3, the Model X, and now the Model Y. What does that spell? S3XY. Turn the three around, it's an E. S-E-X-Y. All of Tesla's current models, at least when the, the Y is unveiled, will amount to sexy. And that is on purpose. Elon Musk did that on purpose. And interestingly enough, the only reason why the Model 3 is named the Model 3 and not the Model E, which would make sexy more uh, make more sense, is that Ford already owns the patent and copyrights to the Model E. So Elon Musk used a little bit of leet, leet speak. Is that what you call it when you use numbers and symbols instead of let words? Anyways, leet speak to spell out sexy, S3XY, something gamers do all the time, and Elon Musk is a gamer, he's a, a geek like the rest of us, <laughs> except in no way like the rest of us, his his bank account looks a little bit different than mine, but he grew up programming basic on a Commodore 64 and all that stuff, and he's just, he's silly, and he named his models S3XY, sexy, on purpose. What was the other thing? Oh, quickly address something that, uh, um, we live streamed last week's show because it was my first live broadcast ever. No safety net. But we live streamed it. And somebody mentioned in the comments that fly by that uh, most people don't. I was talking about getting into hobbies and passions and finding what yours is and, and get into it. Uh, he mentioned that most people don't have any time for hobbies in between uh, work and family life. And I understand what he's coming from, but the purpose of Geek Therapy Radio, I've said a lot, many more times on here that, hey, next time you're at Kroger and you see the, that Lego set for seven, ten bucks just on your checkout, you see it every time you go to Kroger, you're a grown ass man or woman, just buy those Legos and spend five to ten minutes. Are you telling me that in a day you don't have five to ten minutes to devote to or at least take a, a, a chance on? exploring a new hobby five to ten minutes on a crossword puzzle five to ten minutes on a jigsaw puzzle five to ten minutes drawing something in a, in a notepad or writing in a notepad just doing something creative five to ten minutes to uh you know fiddle with a twenty dollar again grocery store drone quadcopter yes you do that's the whole point of this of geek therapy radio is helping you find if for if for the most extreme example somebody who says i don't have time to get into a new hobby or a, a geek thing. I, I can't do what I used to do as a, as a child, as a teenager, as an adult. I, I've, I've lost all time. I don't have time for it. Yes, you do. You have five to ten minutes, like I said, to draw in a notebook, to pick up a guitar again, to play with Legos. You do. Five to ten minutes. Do not say you don't. Wake up five to ten minutes earlier. Go to bed five to ten minutes later. Just do something for you. Something creative. Something that stimulates your mind for you. Do it for you because you want to do it. A healthy hobby. Because even just spending three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes on something new, it might spark this passion in you and give you a reason to be excited every day other than uh, going to work in the normal mundane nine to five. Pick up a new hobby, experiment with it for five to ten seconds, five to ten seconds, maybe that might be all it takes, five to ten minutes, just do something creative. Sing in your car for five to ten minutes. Practice singing with the radio. Whatever. Find your geek thing. Embrace your geek thing. Go back to a geek thing you used to be into but didn't have, don't have time for anymore. If you used to be really into video games as a teenager and now you're an adult and you're trudging along nine to five, go on eBay. Buy an old Game Boy for 20 bucks. Get that old game that you used to play as a kid. Pop it in there. Play it on your lunch break. Whatever. Five to ten minutes. Yes, you do have time for that. Okay. The new DeLorean movie's coming out, and I am beyond, beyond stoked. I have been calling for this. I have been wanting this and saying that they, this should happen for, for years, that the DeLorean story, by the way, the movie is called Framing John DeLorean, 
to play on awards. We'll get into in a second, but it comes out in theaters and on demand June 7th of this year. June 7th, framing John DeLorean, and John DeLorean is played by Alec Baldwin. Which is a good choice, actually. And when you see him in the makeup of John DeLorean, he really does look like John DeLorean. Alec Baldwin is a good actor. You may not agree with him politically, but as an actor, he's fine. You love Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson is a... You probably disagree with him politically. Don't don't stop watching actors or enjoying musicians work because you differ with them politically. What a horrible, sad world that would be if you just... You gave up on art because you disagreed with the political, you know politics of the artist so june 7th framing john delorean i've I've been saying this needs a a high quality the delorean story needs a high quality big budget filmmake because it's all there it's all there the story is just waiting to be just fully unleashed it is such a great story so what i'm going to do right now is play the trailer if you're listening to the broadcast or just listening to the podcast um i don't think i'm going to play the video Uh, i might play it on youtube uh but if you're listening to the broadcast or the podcast i'm going to kind of talk over the video a little bit where it needs to be spoken where they have little text you know going across the screen i'm going to fill in the gaps auditorially auditory for you uh here but let's just play the trailer and i will speak over it when i need to i'm clicking play now are you surprised that a feature film hasn't been made about your dad and his life yeah that's his son He's got cocaine, hot chicks, sports cars, bombed out buildings, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, FBI agents, and hardcore drug dealers. Allow me to introduce the DeLorean motor car. Introducing the first feature film, biopic documentary, true story. People have been wanting to do a movie of my life. Of the man behind the DeLorean. I'm going to try to be DeLorean. John DeLorean was the leading man Hollywood producers dream of, and he was real. The art he was of the one steel. Of the Maverick rogues of his day. What the hell is this? That's a GTO. You're out of your damn mind. He married the world's top supermodel. My dad was at the peak of everything, and then came the car. This is the DeLorean Motor Company. It's impossible to start up a car company. This is real innovation. And you've got the money for this? Oh, yeah. John didn't have the money. We were heading for insolvency. John DeLorean is in jail this morning. I just found out a few hours ago. I know nothing. Stability and sanity left the household when he got arrested. When John puts all the chips on the table and loses, you have to play music while everything collapses around him. It's like the... Genius, failure, savior, liar. You start to see another side of John. You did sell your soul. Legend, fraud, visionary, criminal. He is either a beleaguered man or he was the greatest con man to ever come down the pike. Alec Baldwin is John DeLorean. Set up an innocent man. When does DeLorean get to a point where he could have turned back? How far would you be willing to go to save your life's dream? Framing John DeLorean. Okay, so... What it looks like, it's a biopic, so they're going to be um, talking to the actual people involved with the DeLorean Motor Company um, from when it was alive and talking to it about this destruction. But they're also going to talk to the actors, like they're going to interview Alec Baldwin between scenes, basically, while he's getting his makeup put on, what he thinks about the DeLorean story. So it looks very, very fascinating. I am beyond stoked. I'm beyond geeking out to see it. This is what I've been waiting for literally for decades it is such a cool story i always thought it was funny that you know i love back to the future but the delorean story itself the history of delorean motor company and john delorean himself is is way more intriguing than fiction way more that's so awesome thank you for listening to geek therapy radio this week i've been your mental curator johnny hamburger it means the world that you stick with me each week take care geektherapyradio.com and i'll see you next week